Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Kavita Baratake. Thanks for being on the show, Kavita. Thank you for having me, Whitney. Uh, honored to have you here. We met at a conference uh, not too many months ago, and uh, a pleasure to have you on the show as well, and, and to hear about your experience and your growth in this, um, you know, multifamily syndication business, you know, that we're all trying to pursue and are growing all the time. So uh, anxious to hear hear about what you're up to and, and a little about her. She's a principal at Cherry Street Investments and is an Austin-based accredited real estate investor who recently retired from her technology career of 20 years to pursue multifamily investments as a full-time sponsor. She has been an investor since 2009 and is currently invested in over 2,000 doors in San Antonio, Dallas-Fort Worth, Atlanta, and Phoenix as a limited partner and over 450 doors as a general partner and key principal. She is passionate about helping people in their journey towards financial freedom so they can pursue their passions and live the life to their dreams. She runs a Facebook group called purely passive investor group that is focused on educating passive investors through webinars and materials on creating passive income with multifamily, senior assisted living, and more. So Kavita, thank you so much for your time today. I'm looking forward to getting into this. Tell the listeners a little more about where you're located and, and your focus right now. Sure. Um, so thank you for having me on the show first. I've seen a lot of your podcasts and I love it. So I'm really honored to be here today. Uh, I started um, uh, my journey and a little bit about myself. I came from India 23 years ago now, and I went to College Station, Texas A&M, did my grad school and started you know, a tech career. Uh, working 5 p.m. Uh, that was almost 20 years ago, um, and I realized over you know my career that I love what I do. I did when I started, but after 20 years of it, I wasn't waking up with the same enthusiasm. So I was like, okay, I really need to change and be passionate about what I'm doing. So I think influ influenced by a lot of books, a lot of people around me, um, financial freedom, independence. I wanted the ability to choose what I wanted to do with my time. Um, my daughter is now 14 and she's leaving home for college in four years. So it became sort of like a critical juncture for me to say, I really want to spend some time with her. And then I was juggling a full-time job. I was trying to be a single parent. I was trying to take care of two puppies and I was trying to learn multifamily business and manage a portfolio of single family homes that I have in Austin and San Antonio. And so at some point I was so overwhelmed that I'm like, I can't do this anymore. I really need to focus on something in that something has to be, uh, that I'm really passionate about that. I wake up and I'm like, yes, someone hit the ground running. So I realized, um, in my journey of landlording and being a single family homeowner that that wasn't the long-term solution for me. Like I would not retire myself on single family homes because, the more money I put into it, uh, it was cash flowing initially, and then taxes and taxes really killed me. <laughs> like between two and three and three percent, three point five percent, some places, we don't really make any money after all this. And this is something I explain to a lot of investors who come to me and talk about investing in single family homes right now in this market. So I kind of wear them away from it, but also. My journey taught me that, okay, landlording was cool. Uh, I had a good time initially, and then there was a point of overwhelm where it didn't scale. So I decided to look into multifamily, and when I got into multifamily, it seemed like it was really hard and there wasn't enough information. So I ended up driving to Dallas almost every weekend for two years to learn from a mentoring group out there. And just to do passive investments in multifamily, because at that time I, I had a very you know, um, uh, a busy W2 job that I couldn't take time off from. So I spent all my weekends and evenings learning about multifamily. So when I decided to quit my job, I, when I thought about what I'd be doing, the first thing that came to my mind is that I want to help people like me who have busy jobs in 
finding investments that allow them to create that passive income, not just finding investments, but educating them as well. Because I felt like I went through a lot of hoops to learn that, but I felt like, okay, this could have been an easier process. It didn't have to be so hard, not as a passive. I get that apartment business is difficult as an active sponsor because there are so many moving pieces to it, but as a passive investor, what do I need to learn? I need to learn how to do due diligence on an investment. I need to make sure that the sponsor is tight and is a good investment. So I felt like I could help them distill it down to a smaller set of things where they didn't have to go to get that information, but it could come to them. So that was sort of my motivation in starting uh, the Pioli Passive Group. And um, I really want to help people towards financial freedom because I feel like I want them to pursue their passions and not just be in a job because they have to pay the bills. Nice. No, it's important. Go ahead. No, I just went off. So I just <laughs> pause a little bit. No, it's good stuff. And, and it's great. That, and I like the group too. And you know, where people can come and, and learn and, and you can help educate them about why it's important. And, and I'd love for us to do that today. And us dive in a little bit about, you know, what you're educating these people on and, and maybe they're, you know, how do they, how do they get to this group and, and who are these types of individuals and, you know, who, um, you know, that you're educating? Uh, sure. Uh, so mostly targeting it towards people that are busy professionals that don't have a lot of time. So I started with meetups in Austin and I quickly realized uh, people want to be passive for a good reason. They don't have time and beating Austin traffic and coming to a webinar in the evenings <laughs> isn't, isn't quite the model that was suitable for those set of people because I am working, let's say, nine to five. By the time I beat traffic, I come home at 6.30 in the evening, and the last thing I want to do is leave my kids and step out to drive somewhere for half an hour or an hour to just learn something, right? So there's a gap between uh, people who, you know, want things to come to them now, right? Like it's the information technology where people need, want information to come to them and not have to go to information, get information. So I started doing webinars now. So that's been very positive for me. Also the Facebook group, I'm able to share blogs. I'm able to share information with them that I feel like a lot of people don't know about like depreciation. I didn't know I could write off my income if I played it right, right? Like get the qualified real estate professional and write off my income. So things like that, uh, that a lot of people are not aware of, like investing from their retirement. I look at 401ks and I've asked a lot of people this. It's like, do you know how much your 401k is making? What is it invested in? Two very simple questions. And people always are like, um, no idea. It's like, probably some 2043 retirement fund, you know, like I can retire in 20 years. And what is it making? Almost, I don't know, 80% of the people have no idea what it's making. So if I look at the retirement fund and go, okay, they're making maybe four to 5% and could, could we use that better? And a lot of people are not aware of how they could use that better. You know, could you roll over it over to a solo 401k or to an IRA and invest that in alternative investments like real estate? So, I felt like I took a longer path to learn all that. And I want to help people short circuit that a little bit. Like you don't have to go through all these hopes to learn this. You know, this has to be more commonplace knowledge. Um, because what we get from most financial advisors are this whole 80-20 stock split, you know, put it 80% in stocks, 20% in bonds. I mean, the usual canned advice, right? But when I started attending events and conferences, what I got out of it was the wealthy don't invest like that. Mm. You know, it's the middle class that invest like that. And the middle class stay middle class until they're 65. So you most of the time have to wait till you're 65 and maybe you will have enough money to actually retire. So I learned from attending all these conferences and seeing all these wealthy people that this is not my fast track to retirement. It's not going to work like that. So I think I want to bring some of what I've learned to people and I hope to be able to do that through my group. Nice. Okay. So, so these people are, you know, coming to the group and then could you, I guess let's talk about, you know, maybe a few big questions or maybe a few big things that you initially want them to know, you know, a couple, you know, things that they, you know, they're not going to understand multifamily or real estate, all these things, but you know, that's why it's so important and you're trying to educate them. But what are some of the first few things that you're going to make certain that they understand? Uh, for, I, I find that retirement accounts is the best place to start with most people because people who think they don't have money, 
they usually have money in retirement accounts and they're not doing anything much with it where they're actually growing that income. So I feel like that is one of the best places for me uh, to educate them on how they could be using their retirement accounts better. What, how they could create a, either a QRP or a solo 401k to invest those, that money better. Um, the other thing was also multifamily. Since I work in the multifamily space, it's natural for me to teach them, okay, this is how a typical passive multifamily business works. Uh, I'm not only planning to teach them what I know, but I also want to get guest speakers on. To, I mean, in my meetup here, I did like a 1031 exchanges. Uh, Topics around real estate and investing that people should know about, right? 1031 exchanges, um, uh, hotels, assisted living. There are just so many investments out there that are alternative investments, like still real estate, because I find that a lot of my friends and family and people that I know think, when they think real estate, they think about, go buy a single family home. It's just something that we have all been conditioned to think, right? So I want them to think outside that box of single family homes and that, that being an investment because it's not always a great investment. It was probably in 2008 when it got trashed, but right now it's the higher the market and I don't want people to get into single family homes thinking it's a great investment because if you do the returns on the paper, you don't make much money. Hmm. So how do you, how do you, I guess, help them to understand that like commercial investing, you know, investing in commercial real estate and syndication is better than single family? Um, so my, in my um, presentation, which I did a webinar last week, and I have another one coming up on Wednesday, is focused on uh, passive investing and in syndications. And I kind of illustrate, okay, here's what the single family investing looks like. Here's what multifamily looks like. So for example, let's say you buy a one unit. Here's the property management fees you're paying. Here's the overhead you have. Here are the taxes. And when I buy an apartment unit, which is 100 units, here's what my structure looks like. Here's how I, I introduce economies of scale. Here's where you don't have to deal with tenants. You don't have to deal with toilets. You don't have to deal with any of those things. And you're just getting your cash on cash returns and your total returns at the end. You do have to give up some control, but do you really want that control with your full-time job? Mm, nice. So, you know, what if they say, you know, Kavita, you know, I, I really, uh, I feel like I don't have any control if I just hand you the money. You know, how, how, do, how does that work? You know, how's that different than the stock market or investing that way? You are really investing in a tangible asset, right? You're not investing in a stock market, which is not control. You have no control on the stock market, whereas this is a property that you have some control over as an investor as well. I mean, sure, you don't have day-to-day -day control of it, but you know, I was talking to another investor about investing like in Phoenix. So if you look at the spread in Phoenix market, when single family homes crashed, it was like 40% dip. Whereas the multifamily business in Phoenix didn't, the spread was only like one and a half, two percent in the worst time of the market and the best time. So I try to explain to them that multifamily doesn't go through the same cycles as bad as a severe cycle that single family goes through. And also people need a place to live, right? This is not an expenditure that is discretionary. This is a required, like I need a roof over my head. So their money is better in that kind of an asset than putting it in the stock market right now. And I, I, a lot of people have lost a lot of money the last few weeks in the stock market already. So, yeah. Nice. And so, you know, I'd like to ask too, though, about this, you know, you've started this group, this Facebook group and the, the purely passive investor group. And, and, you know, as far as growing your brand and your, and your business, you know, how, how has that group helped that? I think, you know, I, I always think of Rod Cleave. He was one of the people who really influenced me because when he said this and it stuck with me, it's not about becoming successful or it's not about uh, being a successful person. It's about adding value to people. And I find that this group has allowed me to add value to people. And I think always, you know, I, I, people who are getting into the multifamily business always say, hey, how do I do this? Or, you know, I'm, I mean, I haven't been in that, lo that long, but people are asking me for advice. And I'm, I always say it's just 
it's about adding value. If you add value, people will come to you and people will invest with you. And for me, that group is all about how can I add value to the people that I'm connected to. Mm. Very important. Yeah, that's awesome. Adding value, adding value to other people. Yes, I agree completely. Yeah. And so, so that, uh, yeah, and you're adding value to the people in that group, right? I mean, all the time. So um, that's awesome. And so wh what, uh, what would you say has been the hardest part of just this syndication journey altogether for you? I think doing my first deal. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I, I spent almost a year underwriting. Like, I don't know, I must have underwritten at least like 100 units, 100 apartments, uh, but got nowhere, like submitted LOIs, didn't get anywhere. So it was a very frustrating process to start with. And then I realized, you know, I should really be partnering with people who have done this before. <laughs> I don't have to reinvent the wheel, right? Because when you have someone on your team that has the track record and experience to close on deals, they get the deals. And so I feel like in this business, it's absolutely essential and imperative to partner with people and who have the track record so you can ride on that track record initially but once you have you stand on your own you can take off so i think for me that's been a, definitely a growing experience because when i started i was like you know i have um x amount of dollars and i want to buy my own apartment i really did i did not want to syndicate i wanted to buy my own 40 unit apartment in san antonio and i spent a year trying to do that and I was like, this is not working. And I'm glad um, one of the, my mentors, um, I don't know if you know Ferraz, uh, Ferraz talked me out of it and I'm so glad he did. And he really sat me down and asked me, what do you think, why do you think you want to do this? And uh, when I talked to him, I realized I don't really want to do it because that's all I'll be doing, right? Like if I take on an apartment by myself and I try to fix it up and I do everything, that will consume me and not allow me to move fast. So partnership is everything in this business. I couldn't agree more. Uh, and so tell me though, how are you all preparing, for, say, for another downturn? Conservative underwriting, really. Um, so all our underwriting, and that's something I really want to work. Um, when I go on a team, I really spend a lot of time analyzing their deals just to see that the underwriting is conservative enough. You know, we are underwriting like exit caps, one and a half, even 200% um, over uh, purchase caps. Um, just rent growth, all of that, you know, I think uh, conservative underwriting really plays it plays into it. Um, I also make sure that we uh, stress test the deal and make sure, okay, what, what did the occupancy look like in the downturn? You know, could, could we at least handle that occupancy and still break even? You know, we're not making a lot of money if things go south, but at least can we hold on to the property? You know, we don't want to lose the property. So I think those kinds of stress, the stress test is very important. And um, I also tell my investors as a part of that due diligence, they should be stressed, asking their sponsors if they're stress tested, stress tested those deals. Yes. No, I couldn't agree more. Great, great advice. And, and I like to, you, you elaborated on what stress testing is a little bit in different ways that you all do that. And, uh, and so what's a way that you all have recently improved your business that we could all apply to ours? Um, I think for me, um, as a sponsor, just Building my network of investors has been really important, obviously. You know, the more investors I have, the more deals I have, the more we can close. Uh, so for me, um, a lot of it is hinged on education. I feel educated investors are the best investors. So I always tell my friends, if you have money, I don't want it. I want you to make an educated decision. I will educate you. And if you still want to invest after that, I'll take your money. But I, I feel like education is it for, as an investor. Um, and if I have a sponsorship business or I'm in the business of syndicating apartments, I need to have educated investors on my, uh, on my deals. And what's the, uh, what's the best way you, that, or the best thing you've done to help build your list of investors? Um, I think a lot of it has been word of mouth. I really haven't had to do much because 
I mean, this business is like a relationship business. The more people you connect with, the more people hear about you. It's just like random people call me and they say, oh, I heard about you from this RIA group. And I just wanted to talk to you about this investment. What do you think about buying this house? And, you know, one thing leads to another. So I, I'd say word of mouth is very powerful. So um, in conjunction with that, it's like what you do, um, should not be short-sighted. I feel everything you do in this business has to be in the long term, building that relationship and building the connection and genuinely wanting to help your investors get get to their goals. And and what's the uh, I guess the best way that you're educating your investors as well? You mentioned how important that was, and how how do you do that outside the group? Um, outside the group. I mean, it's mostly inside the group. I, I host webinars, so I it's open to people. Anybody can join. You know, I'll share the recordings as well. So that's probably primarily one of the ways. But I also reach out to people and say, hey, if you want me to come and talk to a group of people, I'm happy to come talk to your friends group or wherever, you know, you want me to be because I'm just happy to connect with people. I love networking and I have uh, attended, I don't know, an event a month this year and I'm just like, conferenced out. <laughs> I understand that. Yeah. Um, what's your, uh, your best advice for caring for investors? Caring for investors. Um, yeah. Keep their goals in mind, right? Like what is, what is their goal? What is their, um, what is their knowledge level? Um, there are some investors that I don't work with, right? Like if I feel that it's not a good match for me, I don't care how interested they are. I just feel like I will do them a disservice because we are not on the same wavelength. So for me, it's very important that I connect with them and I feel like they trust me. I think that's super important hmm. with, yeah. their, with their investments. Very important. Very important. Any, any ways that you kind of go above and beyond to help build that trust? Uh. Again, I, I will talk to a lot of people who might get no investments out of. So I don't feel like I'm doing it from a place of, hey, I want your money or I want your right. investment and then talking to you because of that. No, I'm like, if multifamily is not a good investment for you, I totally understand. You have $500,000. I'm not going to tell you to park it all in multifamily. You know? So I feel like they know that I'm looking out for them because I wouldn't do something with their money that I wouldn't do with my own money. I think that's sort of my guiding principle. What would I do with my own money? Um, would I do what advice I'm giving someone else? So, no. so I feel like I build up that rapport of, you know, hey, I'm, I'm here to help you. I don't really, you don't really have to invest with me, but if it's single family is what you want, don't invest in Austin, please. <laughs> 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 I, I have, I've, I've put so many people out of the Austin market. Realtors in Austin will hate me. <laughs> what, what's the, what would you say is the number one thing that's contributed to your success? Um, hmm, that's a good question. Um, I think um, my connection with people. Um, and I didn't realize I was doing this. It was very unconscious. I have been talking about real estate and my real estate life for about 10 years now on Facebook and social media. And a lot of people know that I'm, they associate me with everything real estate. And honestly, 10 years ago, I wasn't trying to build a brand. I wasn't trying to any of those things. It was just me sharing that, Hey, I'm so excited. I got this house. And so it, it weirdly turned around this year when I went full time and I realized over time people had been calling me about investments and I'm like, why are they talking to me? I, I'm not an investment advisor. <laughs> so it, I became sort of a de facto, you know, Hey, people turn to me for real estate investments. So it was interesting because I was, I finally realized I had created a brand without realizing that I had. And now I'm, you know, I'm grateful for it really. So that that's a that's all that says a lot about you though you created a brand and you didn't even realize it and so you know i tell people all the time they're always everybody's wanting to know you know how to raise capital how to do you know and i, and I tell people you're always raising capital you know even before you get into the syndication business you've been raising capital you know just how you present yourself how you talk to people all those things you know a long time before you actually try to do a deal uh, yeah. so that's yeah great advice and uh, any other tips as far as how, uh, you know, you could help the listener uh, to be able to raise more capital or, or to connect with more high net worth investors? Uh, so I've been exploring a lot of that myself. You know, I, I, I think from 
a person's perspective. For example, now I've been reaching out to a few realtor groups in Austin thinking, if I was a realtor and I'm a qualified real estate professional, I could use depreciation to wipe off my income. Wouldn't I want to know about it? And somehow I felt like that group is not very well tapped. So think about, think outside the box about don't go to real estate conferences over and over again, because you meet the same set of people after a while. So maybe go to a tech conference, maybe go to something somewhere else, another audience that you don't think might, they might have a high net worth, but you don't think of them as a traditional, okay, it's not a real estate conference, but you'll be surprised with the kind of people you meet because they are interested to learn about investment. So I went recently to another financial services conference, which has nothing to do with real estate. And it was surprising how many people there wanted to invest in real estate. You know, it was, it, those are alternative investments, life insurance and all these other investments. But a lot of those people still are looking at real estate investments and they don't know where to start. So kind of branch out and think outside the box when you connect with people. Nice. Now you got to get creative, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. If you do the same things everybody else is doing, then you'll get the same results, right? Yes. So. so. I Kavita, you've been a great guest. I really appreciate your time your time today and elaborating on how you've been successful educating your investors and raising capital. And, and you know, but tell the listeners uh, how you like to give back. Uh, give back. That's super important to me. Thank you for asking that. Um, I actually um, wrote my first newsletter and I got really good feedback on it. It took me eight months to get to my newsletter, but I made it. <laughs> <laughs> and I wrote like a lot of stuff. So one of the things I did mention there and my, um, uh, the people in my group are very well aware. I, um, I have three places that I like to give back. Uh, one is um, uh, this year, I started this year and I intend to do this every year. I did the MS-150, which is a 150 mile ride, like a bike ride to, uh, to raise money for uh, MS, multiple sclerosis sufferers. So this is very close to my heart because one of my close friends is suffering from MS and a very progressive form of MS. So she's in a wheelchair and she had to go through severe um, uh, intervention. And then she has two three-year-old boys. So that was really heartbreaking for me because she couldn't run behind her kids and raise them like a normal mom. And I, I, I felt the pain. So I started doing that and um, we did a bunch of us road from Houston to Austin. And I intend to do that every year to raise money for MS. But besides that, my daughter is actually, a, a, has a heart condition called cardiomyopathy. So that charity, it's a children's cardiomyopathy foundation. So that's been very close to my heart. I've run for them. I've raised money for them. And um, just generally kids who are sick kind of, you know, uh, yeah, they, I'm sensitive to it because I had a very sick child when she was little. So that's really important to me. Um, and also, um, I don't know if you know, Will Crozier, uh, he's one of uh, the folks who's doing these uh, operations for kids in Philippines. So I contribute to his charity, but I really look up to him because someday I want to grow up and be Will. <laughs> I want to do that. That's really my purpose in life is to... Uh, get to the point that, you know, I, exp I create all these wealthy people <laughs> and then <laughs> they can contribute to my charity for um, sponsoring operations, like especially heart operations that a lot of kids die in poor third world countries for like a hole in a heart, a very simple minor surgery, which takes hundred dollars to fix in India and people can't afford it and they let their kids die. So that's, that's a cause which is very near and dear to my heart. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate that. And just your, your passion behind giving back. And we can all see that. Appreciate that. And uh, tell the listeners how they can get in touch with you and learn more about you. Um, I'm always available. Um, um, I have a Facebook group that's purely passive investor group. Um, also Cherry Street Investments. Um, and of course, my uh, uh, Kavita Bartaki, you can look me up on Facebook and any of the social media. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show, brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate, while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. 
Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.